It's August the 7th, 1942. The famous Japanese Tainan Air Group is based in Rabaul. The airmen share a meal before today's mission. The chef in the mess hall prepares the food for the airmen, which brings us to the sponsor of today's video. All top chefs know the importance of high quality kitchen knives and Kamakoto produce exquisite handcrafted Japanese steel kitchen knives using traditional techniques that date back to the Edo period of Japan. Each kitchen knife has a satin finish and comes in a beautiful heavy duty ash wooden box, which makes it a great gift. The construction of these perfectly balanced works of art takes several years from start to finish. But what makes these knives extra special is the unbelievably sharp edge of the Japanese steel that will amaze you with how it cuts through the toughest kitchen tasks with ease. Used by Michelin starred chefs around the world, Kamikoto products come with a lifetime guarantee and they ship worldwide. Kamikoto are having a Valentine's Day sale and for Yarnhub viewers using the code Yarnhub or by clicking the link in the description, you can get $50 off any purchase. Treat yourself or someone special with these flawless traditional Japanese steel kitchen knives. The pilots scramble with orders to escort military bombers to the islands of Guadalcanal, Tulagi and the Florida Islands. One of the pilots in the group is Saburo Sakai, Petty Officer, Second Class. Sakai is a renowned ace pilot who has already won numerous aerial battles and he was an invaluable asset to the group. The Japanese bombers let loose their deadly cargo from high altitude. As the Japanese head for home, they nervously watch the skies. Suddenly, there's a cry from over the radio. Bandits! The fight is on. The US fighters go for the Japanese bomber formation and Japanese escorts join in the fray. Saburo Sakai and three other pilots from his group engage a Grumman F-4F Wildcat fighter in combat. Good odds for the Japanese, but at the controls of the Wildcat is future ace James Pug Sutherland. He manages to evade the Japanese fighters and gets on Sakai's tail. Sutherland lines up the zero, but to Sakai's amazement, he doesn't fire. Inside the Wildcat, Sutherland is confounded by his machine guns, which have jammed. If he can keep on this zero, then maybe he can scare it off or even get the guns to be operational. He chases Sakai and the Japanese pilot is weaving in the air, pulling hard in turns, trying to shake off the US fighter and get on its tail. Finally, with colossal effort, he manages to get behind the Wildcat. This dogfight is one of the tensest Sakai has ever had. His A6M2 has only 60 rounds per barrel for its 20 mm cannon. So Sakai switched them off to conserve ammo and only uses the 7.7 mm rounds. Sakai later said, I had poured around five or 600 rounds of ammunition directly into the Grumman. The airplane didn't fall, but kept on flying. I thought this very odd. It had never happened before. And I closed the distance between the two airplanes until I could almost reach out and touch the Grumman. To my surprise, the Grumman's rudder and tail were torn to shreds looking like an old torn piece of rag. With his plane in such condition, no wonder the pilot was unable to continue fighting. A Zero, which had taken that many bullets, would have been a ball of fire by now. Sutherland said of the battle, my plane was in bad shape, but still performing nicely in a low blower, full throttle and full low pitch. Flaps and radio had been put out of commission. The after part of my fuselage was like a sieve. She was still smoking from incendiary, but not on fire. All of the ammunition box cover on my left wing were gone and 20 mm explosives had torn some gaping holes in its upper surface. My instrument panel was badly shot up. Goggles on my forehead had been shattered. My rear view mirror was broken. My plexiglass windshield was riddled. The leak proof tanks had apparently been punctured many times as some fuel had leaked out and down into the bottom of the cockpit. Even though there was no steady leakage, my oil tank had been punctured and oil was pouring down my right leg. At this moment, with the Wildcat practically disabled but still flying, Sakai switched to the 20 mm cannons. Ripping into the Wildcat, its left wing shears off and starts to tumble out of the air. Sutherland knows he's done. He bails out and despite being wounded, he parachutes to safety. Sakai rejoins the group. As he gains altitude together with his supporting fighters, he spots a lone Douglas SBD Dauntless dive bomber. Several Japanese attack and another fight is on. Despite the odds being against him, 
The pilot, Lieutenant Dudley Adams, shoots into Sakai's plane with his two 0.5-inch Ford machine guns. He puts a fist-sized hole into Sakai's plane canopy, but the Zeros quickly gain the upper hand and skillfully working together, they down the Dauntless. Adams manages to bail out of his stricken warbird and his parachute opens. His gunner, Harry Elliott, does not make it out. Sakai and his group continue to search for new targets. As they approach the Tulagi Island, there's another cry across the radio. Bandits! It's a group of eight aircraft. They're distant, but Sakai is confident it's another group of wildcats and starts gaining altitude to engage them. Sakai had superior long-distance vision and reflexes way better than his other wingmate, so he turned first and hit the throttle so quickly that his wingmen were unable to catch up and lagged far behind. The Japanese approached the formation from behind and below, with Sakai in the lead. Closing fast now on the Wildcats, Sakai noticed them bunching up. Strange, but it looks like the Japanese were still undetected by the Americans. Closer and closer he got, and then Sakai's blood runs cold. It's not Wildcats, it's Dauntlesses. With their rear machine guns pointing right at the attacking Japanese, the Americans had spotted Sakai and his supporting fighters clear as day, all the way. They had bunched up for greater defense and they're now preparing to rain down hell on the Japanese attackers. Sakai rocks his wings in warning. It's Dauntlesses! But at the terrific speed, the Zero is too close to dodge. If it disengages, it's a sitting duck. Best to fight on and try and take down the Americans. Without a choice, Sakai engages. He opens up with machine guns, receiving eight streams of bullets in return. Saburo is weaving and dodging as best he can and clips one Dauntless, which starts leaning to the side and falling. Then another. One of the bullets, sent by rear gunner Harold Jones, goes right through the Zero's canopy, and it didn't miss this time. The bullet ploughed through the metal frame of Sagai's goggles, denting it, tearing the leather of his helmet and breaking his skull, while the glass from the shattered canopy flies inside and injures his eyes. Sakai passes out, and the US pilots report their victory as they watch the Japanese fighter disappearing down below. Saburo Sakai slowly and painfully comes to his senses. What's happened? Where is he? With a jolt, he realizes that the blue haze looming large is the sea, and he and his damaged aircraft are hurtling towards it. Blind in the right eye, barely seeing anything with the left, half of his body paralyzed, he struggles to pull the Zero out of the uncontrolled dive. It's not working. His mind still clouded, he starts searching for an American warship to ram. If he would die that day, he would do so as a samurai. But luckily for him, and for any US warships, there are none around, and the cold air blasting through the broken canopy finally brought Sakai to his senses. With exceptional skill, he manages to get his plane under control. Checking his instruments, he calculates he just might be able to return to the Rabul airfield if he's careful. Sakai points the nose of his Zero along the Solomon Islands, roughly towards the base. Trying and failing to stop the bleeding in his head and control the aircraft at the same time, he loses and regains consciousness, correcting his course every time he came to. Once he woke up to the feeling of blood beating in his head like a hammer, he was flying upside down. Dangerously close to the open water, he frantically returns the plane to the upright position and gains altitude. And when he sees a volcano in the distance, he realizes he's almost home. With fuel quickly running out, he dives to land and nearly crashes into the fighters lined up on the airfield. Pulling up and going around again, he puts the warbird down on the second attempt. Everyone thought he had been killed in battle, and the personnel of the base ran to his severely damaged fighter in astonishment. As they drag Sakai, bleeding and barely able to move out of the plane, he insists on reporting to his superior officer, and only then he collapses. With a serious head injury that led to partial paralysis and the loss of sight in his right eye, Saburo Sakai managed an almost five-hour trip across 560 naval miles and made it back to his base in one piece. Months of surgery gave him back the functionality to the left side of his body. However, his right eye would never see again. He became an expert instructor, but by June 1944, the war was going on against Japan and they desperately needed expert pilots. And Sakai answered the call. By August the 15th, 1945, Japan concluded a ceasefire agreement with the Allied forces, 
and on August the 18th, two reconnaissance consolidated B-32 Dominators were flying over the country's territory to see if it complied with the ceasefire. Suddenly, 17 Japanese fighters mistake the planes for B-29 bombers and attack, seriously damaging them and killing one of the personnel. One pilot involved was Saburo Sakai. He and his fellow pilots were all labelled undesirable. In September, the war ended and Sakai was promoted to sub-lieutenant and decommissioned from the Navy. The after-war years weren't kind on Sakai. His skills as a fighter pilot became useless. He was left out of work, finding odd jobs and constantly in need of money. In 1947, his wife died of illness. In 1952, he married again and opened a small printing shop. There, he invited family members of his fallen comrades and other undesirables like himself to work there. In 1955, a Dutch pilot came to the US Occupation Administration, telling a story that no one had heard before. He said that he had been transporting civilians in a DC-3 from the island of Java in 1942, when a Japanese fighter intercepted him and ordered him to follow. When the pilot refused, the fighter shifted his position as if to attack, but then the pilot saw women and children on board. In the fighter was Sakai. He had been given some simple orders bring down all aircraft over Java, be it civilian or military. But when Sakai saw women and children inside the Dutch plane, he felt he had to disobey his orders. With this news, Sakai rose from being an undesirable to becoming a war hero. He couldn't believe what happened, but the real worldwide fame came to him two years later when his autobiographical book, Samurai, was published in the US. After the war ended, Sakai became a Buddhist acolyte, vowing never to take the life of any living creature, not even a mosquito. This vow, as well as his opposition to the policy of rearmament, didn't bring him much sympathy, but he stood his ground. He kept his active position, even in his old age. Microsoft developers consulted him in creating Combat Flight Simulator 2. He said, to fly is just like swimming. You do not forget easily. I have been on the ground now for more than 10 years. I have been on the ground now for more than 10 years. I have been on the ground now for more than 10 years. I have been on the ground now for more than 10 years. I have been on the ground now for more than 10 years. I have been on the ground now for more than 10 years. I have been on the ground now for more than 10 years. I have been on the ground now for more than 10 years. I have been on the ground now for more than 10 years. I have been on the if you haven't yet, please subscribe to the channel and please watch more videos of ours. Thank you.